Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for our presentation titled Detection and Monitoring of Mutations from Liquid Biopsies, a Clinical Study. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Monica Sadel, a Senior Development Scientist from the Genomics and Cellular Research at Sativa. For a complete biography of our speaker, please visit the tab at the top of your screen. Now, if any questions arise during the presentation, we encourage you to submit them through the Q&A box. Our speaker will address your questions following the end of the presentation. Please join me now in welcoming Monica Sadel. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Welcome, Monica. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Monica Seidel, and I'm part of R&D team at Cytiva in Genomic and Diagnostic Solution uh, business segment. Our mission at Cytiva is to uh, accelerate and advance therapeutics, uh, and by doing so, uh, we believe that we are getting closer to the situation where access to uh, life-changing therapies are uh, widely uh, available. Um, how do we achieve our mission? Uh, we achieve our mission by providing uh, the customers with uh, tools and services for diagnostic-related research, and we also maintain a wide network of collaboration, including academic institutions, where this kind of research is taking place. Uh, today, I will be talking about liquid uh, biopsies and uh, their application in cancer diagnostic. Uh, this is a rapidly growing field uh, fueled by uh, current focus on development and advances in uh, precision medicine. Uh, so what would be covered in my uh, presentation? Uh, as an introduction, I will briefly cover liquid uh, biopsies, uh, and then I will describe different type of nucleic acids that can be found uh, in, uh, in the bloodstream. And they have obviously different relevance and applicability into uh, biomarker profiling. Uh, then we will dive a bit deeper into a cell-free DNA um, nucleic acid, and this is the only type of analyte that is currently used in clinical practice. Uh, we will consider challenges associated with liquid biopsies, and we also uh, will discuss some avenues that are being undertaken in order to uh, overcome those challenges. The core of my presentation uh, will focus on results of a study that we conducted uh, in which we tried to answer the question whether uh, site selection assisted extraction of cell free DNA uh, can allow for higher sensitivity of uh, cancer associated mutation uh, detection. The term uh, liquid uh, biopsy uh, covers the collection uh, of bodily fluids for the pur purpose of genetic profiling. And there's a number of different bodily fluids can, that can be collected for this purpose, uh, including urine, cerebrospinal fluid, uh, saliva. But this is the blood that is being currently used and, uh, in clinical practice and is mostly investigated. Uh, the first report uh, describing the presence of nucleic acids in the bloodstream goes back to 1948. Uh, however, at this particular point in time, uh, the discovery was completely unnoticed and, and put to rest for roughly another 15 years, when another report showed that uh, fetal uh, DNA can be found and detected in maternal plasma. Uh, this discovery laid the foundation for uh, non-invasive prenatal screening that is currently being used uh, in uh, clinical practice uh, for detection of chromosomal aneuploidy in pregnancies. And this amazing success that the liquid uh, biopsies achieved in this field triggered extensive research into the possibility of using uh, liquid biopsies for uh, biomarker profiling in cancer, cardiovascular disorders, autoimmune diseases, diabetes, or uh, for early detection of uh, organ rejection and transplantology. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, as for uh, cancer, uh, related uh, use for liquid biopsies, uh, their applicability is uh, being researched in both early and advanced uh, stage cancer. And for early stage cancer, it's mostly uh, evaluated in terms of being a screening tool. So we are trying to find, uh, find out whether liquid biopsies uh, are able to detect cancer in otherwise healthy individuals. So in those patients that uh, do not present any clinical manifestation of the disease, but cancer is already developing. 
Um, although there is uh, a one FDA approved uh, test for uh, screening of early cancer, uh, this is a very challenging uh, field, and this is mostly due to the limited sensitivity of detection cancer of detecting cancer associated mutations. Uh, uh, because in an early stage cancer, the amount of tumor uh, derived fraction in the circulation is extremely low. The reported sensitivity uh, varies depending on the cancer type and cancer location between 30 and 80 percent, meaning that the risk of false negative results uh, is extremely high. Uh, similar challenges uh, apply to the use of liquid biopsies in the detection of minimal residual disease. So this would correspond to the detection of uh, cancers. Uh, the much higher success rate uh, for liquid biopsies is found in advanced cancer, and this is reflected in the current uh, guidelines um, advocating the use of liquid biopsies for uh, genetic profiling in circumstances where tissue biopsy is not available. Uh, and this applies to advanced cancers such as lung cancer, um, prostate cancer, or breast cancer. Uh, another field which holds a lot of promise for liquid biopsies is for monitoring purposes. And this will be monitoring how well the therapy is working and also monitoring and the vaccinations and unfortunately happen in majority of patients following the first line of therapy. Uh, what needs to be said is the big the biggest advantage of liquid uh, biopsy is its potential to uncover the whole uh, genetic landscape of the tumor. All happen in the tumor in a spatial and temporal uh, manner. And uh, for that reason, um, uh, there's a number of different um, cell-free uh, nucleic acid that can be found in the circulation. If we concentrate on RNA, there are two main groups. Uh, one is non-coding RNA, and the second is uh, coding RNA. So coding RNA rep is represented by uh, messenger RNA, which encodes protein. Uh, this is a minor fraction in the circulation, and in, uh, in its intact form is almost exclusively found in exosomes. Uh, the reason behind it is uh, when mRNA is released into the bloodstream, it's rapidly degraded by nucleases, and for that reason um, constitutes a rather unsuitable uh, analyte uh, for biomarker profiling. Uh, among non-coding RNAs, which is a very diverse set of, of molecules, uh, but majority of them, with a few exceptions, are responsible for uh, gene expression modulation, it is the microRNA uh, which attracted the highest amount of attention. Uh, those are small molecules of around 18 to 24 base, per, base pairs uh, long. Uh, they are quite stable in the circulation due to the, uh, to the fact that they are being uh, in complexes with protein. And they are responsible for translational silencing of genes, and this is uh, done through uh, microRNA binding to uh, three prime untranslated region in their messenger RNAs. Uh, so one microRNA uh, can target a number of messenger RNAs, and this is because this interaction happens for non-full uh, non complementarity of two strands. And this is a heavily researched area. Number of reports show uh, a specific cancer-related uh, signature profile of microRNA expression. Now, if we go into DNA, uh, we can divide the DNA found into the circulation based on its origin. So it's either mitochondrial DNA or cell-free DNA that is represented by genomic DNA released by a number of cells, cells uh, in the organism. Uh, mitochondrial DNA research is in, uh, in, in infancy, and it's not currently used uh, in any of the of the analytical methods for biomarker profiling, although there are a number of reports uh, showing uh, that it's exclusively released by uh, tumor cells and might be used for uh, cancer detection. On the contrary, uh, cell-free DNA is already in clinical practice. Uh, it's used for uh, non-invasive prenatal uh, screening. Uh, it's used uh, in circumstances where tissue biopsy is not uh, feasible in advanced cancer. Um, and it's also used in cancer screening for colorectal cancer in patients which are unable to uh, undergo colonoscopy. Diving deeper into cell-free DNA characteristics, uh, first of all, it is uh, released into the bloodstream through active and passive mechanisms, uh, and those active mechanisms are not fully understood. Uh, as for passive release, it's mostly done uh, by uh, the way of necrosis and apoptosis. 
Uh, cell free DNA represents the pool of genomic DNA released by a number of different cells, including uh, inflamed cells, uh, tumor cells, fetal cells uh, in pregnancy. But it is believed that the majority of cell free DNA in the bloodstream is of hematopoietic uh, origin. Um, in terms of the uh, size of cell free DNA, the peak uh, is centered around 170 base pairs. This is uh, corresponding to the size of the nucleosome. Uh, and the size profile of the cell free DNA, uh, you can see on the right hand side of the slide. This is an electrophorogram uh, created with the use of bioanalyzer, and you show that the size of cell free DNA ranges between 100 to 300 base pairs, but indeed the peak is around 170 base pairs. Uh, there is a number of reports um, showing that. Uh, cell free DNA is fragmented uh, in a different way uh, depending on its origin. Uh, and what is also important, and initially this was uh, something that was considered to use uh, in cancer uh, screening and detection, is that the amount of cell free DNA uh, is, highly, um, is highly increased in uh, advanced cancer. However, it turned out that uh, this high amount of cell free DNA is also associated with other conditions such as pregnancy, uh, autoimmune disorders, or uh, following strenuous exercise. Um, so if you have a, have a look at this slide, which is a very busy slide, and I have no intention to go through all the um, publications that are being listed in the table, uh, I just wanted to attract the uh, attention of the audience to the fact uh, that uh, cell free DNA, which uh, is derived from tumor, uh, is highly fragmented. Uh, and all those publications that I list in the table uh, give three conclusions. Uh, first of all, the fact that the amount of cell free DNA in advanced cancer is much higher than in healthy individuals. Uh, secondly, uh, that there is a clear shift in the size of cell free DNA in cancer patients toward uh, lower fragments, somewhere around or somewhere below 150 base pair. And thirdly, that those fragments uh, that are smaller than rich in tumor fraction. Um, so the biggest challenge uh, of um, cell free DNA and its utility for mutation detection is sensitivity. Uh, this sensitivity, uh, limited sensitivity, originates, of course, from the uh, endpoint detection. I say that. Uh, being currently used for biomarker profiling, uh, but it's also inherent to the specific characteristic that cell free DNA possesses. Uh, so, first of all, the amount of cell free DNA bloodstream is uh, particularly uh, low, but what is even lower is the fraction that derives from the tumor. Uh, in early stage cancer, this fraction uh, is within 0.01% and goes up to 30% in uh, metastatic uh, advanced uh, cancer. On the top of this, if we want to use liquid biopsies to monitor uh, tumor evolution, you can imagine that those clonal cells within the tumor then constitute an even lower fraction of the tumor itself. Uh, what doesn't help the situation is quite often that during plasma processing, uh, there is a significant release of genomic DNA from white blood cells that further uh, dilutes uh, tumor device fraction. And what I mentioned earlier is also the fact that cell free DNA that comes from cancer cells is highly fragmented and also is damaged, uh, meaning that sometimes uh, it's present in a single stranded form or in double stranded form where one of the strands is nicked. Uh, this imposes a lot of challenges because uh, almost majority, all, the majority of currently used um, next generation library preparation methods use uh, double stranded library preps, which unfortunately uh, are not allowing to capture those small fragments and those neck fragments uh, in the endpoint um, in the endpoint library and uh, in NGS uh, analysis. Um, if we now go to the different the technologies that are being used for uh, detection of mutations, uh, I listed both two different ones. Uh, one is digital droplet PCR, and the second one is targeted NGS. You can see that both of those methods, they have a um, different uh, limit of detection. 
Uh, and this limit of detection uh, varies depending on some uh, technological changes that are being implemented to the to the standard uh, tech, technique in order to lower limit of detection. For NGS, for example, that would be use of unique molecular identifiers that would allow to eliminate uh, PCR created uh, errors, or um, the use of uh, bioinformatic tools that allow to eliminate sequencing errors. Uh, nevertheless, the first question that everyone will probably ask, if the limit of detection for digital drug with PCR is so low, why isn't it this technique exclusively used for biomarker profiling? And the reason behind this is that uh, although it has extremely low sensitivity, this method requires uh, uh, requires that the user knows the mutation a priori to the detection. So you need to know what we are looking for when you are using, like, when you are using digital PCR. Uh, in terms of targeted NGS, this a priori knowledge of mutation identity is not needed. Uh, what is needed is the identity of the gene that we want to investigate. And there are a number of different uh, panels um, that allow sequencing genes that are well known to be associated with cancer. Um, so on the previous slide, I, just, I discussed the challenges uh, associated with typical characteristics uh, that uh, cell-free DNA has. Uh, and there are a number of avenues, avenues that can be undertaken uh, to mitigate those problems. Uh, so, for example, uh, for the release of genomic DNA and the increased yield in cell-free DNA extraction, uh, it has been now advised uh, to use a um, specific type of um, blood collection tubes that allow to limit genomic DNA release from uh, white blood cells and increase the stability of cell-free DNA. Uh, again, for library preparation, uh, it has been suggested that uh, in some cases, single-stranded library preparations uh, might be more uh, suitable in order to capture those uh, nicked and single-stranded uh, fragments of, uh, of DNA. And then I already mentioned uh, the use of uh, bioinformatic tools to eliminate sequencing error in NGS, uh, and also use of uh, unique molecular identifiers uh, to eliminate PCR amplification errors. Um, there is also um, another um, another point at uh, at which we can try to uh, to mitigate the problems related to cell free DNA, and this is the extraction. Um, so here at Cytiva, we develop uh, cell extraction a cell-free DNA uh, kit uh, that is based on magnetic bead technology uh, and has uh, three features that we believe um, allow to uh, to increase the sensitivity in endpoint assay. And those three critical points is the fact that the kit allows to uh, allow, allows to capture uh, low fragments in a very efficient way. Uh, the kit allows to extract cell-free DNA to a high extent. And the third uh, aspect of the kit is the fact that uh, it allows for elimination of genomic DNA carryover. Uh, this principle uh, is illustrated on the electropherogram that you can see on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, so if we have a look. Uh, the blue trace represents uh, plasma extracted with our kit, uh, but before extraction, the plasma was spiked with DNA ladder, and this DNA ladder is represented in the green uh, in the green trace. Uh, so when you have a look at the efficiency of extraction of small fragments, you can see that the blue line overlaps very well with the green line in lower molecular weight um, range. For example, for 50 and 100 base pairs. Uh, when you have a look uh, at the higher molecular weight uh, recovery, you can see that above 300 base pairs, the recovery declines rapidly. And at 2 uh, kb, this recovery is around 20% or below 20%, meaning that the um, carryover of genomic DNA is minimized. So we, of course, wanted to see how uh, our kit performs uh, against leading brands. Uh, so we benchmark uh, the kit against uh, MagMax cell-free DNA kit, which is manufactured by Thermo Fisher Scientific. Uh, and we also tested the kit against uh, Kayamp uh, mini Lot kit, which is manufactured uh, by Kyogen. Um, so in terms of Kyogen kit, this is a silica-based kit that is not very easy to be automated. It can only be automated on instruments manufactured by Kyogen. Uh, in terms of magma kits, this is a very similar format to Cytiva kit. It's based on magnetic bead technology, which allows for automation. 
So if we uh, concentrate on the cell free DNA yield that can be uh, seen on this graph, you can see that there is not much difference in the extract and efficiency between three different kits. They are pretty much uh, similar. Uh, however, uh, when we move to the genomic DNA carryover, uh, we have an obvious advantage in the field. It is Cytiva kit that allows to significantly reduce the presence of a genomic DNA uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the extract um, um, obtained from a patient uh, serum. Of course, we are very encouraged from those results, but uh, the main question that we ask is whether those key uh, performance characteristics that I just described for our kit uh, allow uh, to achieve higher sensitivity of mutation detection in clinically relevant scenario. And for that reason, um, so to answer the question, uh, we uh, designed uh, a small study that involved uh, four patients uh, that were all diagnosed with advanced stage uh, lung cancer. Uh, they donated blood. This blood was uh, processed and uh, plasma was extracted. Uh, the plasma was subjected to uh, library preparation and tumor profiling was done using targeted NGS. So a bit uh, more about uh, patient stratification and why we decided to go with patients uh, with non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, so first of all, uh, this is the cancer that unfortunately is usually detected at a very advanced stage. And the reason behind this, uh, because first of all, there are no screening uh, tests uh, for this cancer. And secondly, the cancer usually is asymptomatic uh, and starts giving symptom, uh, symptoms with metastasis uh, over the uh, okay. Um, the genetic profiling uh, is uh, currently used in clinical practice in order to uh, discover mutations that can be targeted with specific type of therapy. And this uh, genetic profiling is a device uh, uh, for uh, testing the mutation and uh, the mutations in five genes which are listed in, the t in this table. And this includes EGFR, ALK, ROS1, uh, BRAS uh, and NTRK. Uh, all those uh, genes, they called for protein kinases, and all, uh, all of those protein cases, kinases, they have specific inhibitors can, can be used to treat, uh, to treat patients. Um, what is also important, and this is the other reason why we decided to go for uh, for those, uh, for those cohort of patients is the fact that uh, in advanced lung cancer, in circumstances where tissue biopsy is not available, liquid biopsy uh, is advocated uh, by, uh, currently, uh, current, by current clinical uh, guidelines. Uh, the next and very important uh, aspect of this cancer is uh, unfortunate resistance that occurs in the majority of patients following first-line target therapy. And this is specifically uh, true for uh, patients that uh, are positive for mutation in EGFR. Um, usually within 12 months, all of those patients develop uh, secondary uh, resistance. And the secondary resistance is either related to additional mutation in the EGFR gene itself, or uh, for some bypass uh, mechanism that, for example, involves amplification in MET, uh, in MET gene. Okay. Um, so uh, the plasma that was obtained from those patients uh, was extracted using uh, three kits, and we used the same kits as I discussed on previous slides. So this was the MagMax kit from Thermo Fisher Scientific and uh, Kyogen uh, kit uh, QAMP, uh, which is based on, on silica columns. Um, all patients but one uh, were processed with all three kits. Uh, only patient one was processed with Cytiva and Kyogen kit, and this, is, uh, this was due to the limitation uh, in sample volume. Um, the extract uh, were analyzed 
using capillary, uh, capillary electrophoresis on bioanalyzer. And maybe uh, if we first concentrate on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, we see three electrophorograms. Uh, the green trace uh, represents uh, Cytiva extract, the blue uh, trace represents Magmax uh, extract, and the orange one is uh, from Kyogen. Uh, as you can see here, the amount of cell-free DNA, so the main peak centered uh, at around 170 base pairs, is similar between three different kits. However, if you have a look at uh, genomic DNA uh, peak that would represent anything above 700 base pair, you can see that this is uh, present in uh, both Kyogen and Magmax extracts. However, as far as Cytiva kits, it's almost completely uh, absent. When we go to the left-hand side of the slide, uh, this is the summary of the results. So the top uh, graph represents uh, the cell free DNA yield um, separated by the patient and by the kid. And even though there's a lot of diversity uh, in the extraction profile, uh, you can see that pretty much overall the performance of all three kids uh, is similar. Uh, the clear difference uh, is when we go to genomic DNA contamination. This is summarized in the lower graph. You can see that this is the Cytiva kit that allows uh, to limit uh, genomic DNA presence in the extract. Okay. Um, so all of those extracts uh, were subjected to a uh, library preparation. And this um, library preparation um, uh, that we performed uh, used the total volume of all samples. Um, the targeted sequencing was done using ion torrent technology, and the targeted uh, panel that we use is the panel that was developed by Biosept, and it's called Biosept Target Selector NGS Lang Panel. Uh, it uh, allows to sequence 12 genes uh, that are well known to be related to lung cancer. Um, what it needs to be said at this point is that uh, library preparation, uh, sequencing and data analysis was performed uh, at Biosat. Um, so what you see on the slide, uh, those are uh, results from uh, targeted NGS, uh, and I'm going to discuss those results in detail on subsequent slides, but maybe we can just concentrate uh, and compare the mutation frequency between patients and between, uh, between um, kits that uh, were used for extraction. Uh, as you can see, in all cases from patient four to patient one, it is a Cytiva kit that allows uh, to detect mutation at the higher frequency. And this uh, obviously uh, indicates uh, that when uh, plasma is processed with our kit, uh, the extract is enriched in tumor derived uh, derived fraction. What you can see in the lower uh, table, this is the analytical sensitivity uh, of the target selector. And you can see that for uh, hotspot uh, single nucleotide variants, uh, deletions and insertions, uh, the limit of detection goes to 0.1%. Uh, for the novel uh, mutations, this limit of detection is at five, at, excuse me, at 0.5%. Okay, let's now try to uh, dive a bit deeper into uh, into each of the patients. So uh, let's concentrate on patient two and four. Uh, both of those patients uh, were found positive uh, for a mutation in BRAF kinase, and this is the mutation at the position 600, which, uh, which results in the replacement of valine with aspartic acid. Uh, this mutation is a phosphomimetic mutation, it means that even though the protein is not phosphorylated, uh, the presence of negatively and negatively charged aspartic acids make the protein active. Uh, and through this activity, uh, the kinase uh, activates downstream effectors, so it activates MAP kinase, and uh, this signaling le uh, leads to the uncontrolled growth and proliferation of the cells. Uh, this is a very well known mutation for melanoma, and not that uh, prevalent in non-small uh, cell line cancer. I think it's only, it's, it's only present in 2% of the patients, so, so quite rare. Uh, nevertheless, uh, which is uh, quite beneficial for the patients, there is a targeted therapy. And this uh, targeted therapy is both approved uh, in the European Union and, and in the United States, uh, and involves the use of two drugs uh, targeting uh, two different uh, kinases. Uh, so the, the first drug uh, targets BRAF kinase, the second drug uh, targets uh, MAP kinase. Uh, 
And what you can see on the on the table on the right, this is the table taken from Novartis website with a manufacturer of both of both drugs. You can see the clear benefit for those patients, uh, where you can see that um, overall survival is increased to twenty uh, to twenty four months. So I, what I wanted to concentrate on those slides, I wanted to uh, analyze again and go in uh, slightly deeper into the genomic DNA carryover, uh, the yield of cell-free DNA, and how those two things translate into mutation of frequency detected in our assay. Uh, so when we start from patient four, you can see that Cytiva is the best in terms of uh, cell-free DNA yield, and uh, of course the best in terms of in minimizing genomic DNA contamination. And in this particular instance, the mutation allele frequency detected in Cytiva extra is twice as high as in competitors. Um, but I think what we need to concentrate is patient two. Um, have a look at patient two. Patient two, um, uh, the yield um, extracted is similar between three kids. Uh, you can see that the amount of selfie DNA is very low in this patient. And again, you can see that genomic DNA uh, contamination is the lowest uh, in in samples extracted with Cytiva uh, kit. Um, uh, however, uh, or maybe what's important is that the mutation allele frequency uh, for extract um, extract um, process with Cytiva is almost seven times higher than for the competitors get, uh, and this uh, brings us about uh, brings uh, only one conclusion that. Uh, the reduction in genomic DNA contamination is specifically important in circumstances of what self DNA is uh, is a limiting factor. Okay, let's now discuss the results for patient one and patient three. Um, and they are both found uh, positive for mutation in tumor suppressor protein uh, 53. Uh, this is the protein which is uh, quite often uh, mutated in many different in many different cancers. Uh, not so prevalent in non-small cell lung cancer, very prevalent in uh, cancer, lung cancer associated with smoking. Uh, the protein is composed of three domains, uh, with DNA binding domain uh, most important for suppressor activity uh, of this protein. And also, uh, this domain uh, is, um, is uh, targeted by a number of, uh, of mutations uh, that are well known associated with cancer. So this is a mutation hotspot. Uh, those mutations occur in uh, conserved residues that are listed on this slide. And uh, one of those conserved uh, residues is mutated in patient one. Uh, please let me remind you that patient one uh, was only a process with to get skyogen and cytiva due to the sample limitation. Um, I want to concentrate on patient three because this is slightly, uh, slightly uh, more, more um, controversial and slightly more difficult to explain the results. So when we consider um, uh, MacMax kit and uh, the extract from MacMax kit, uh, we didn't detect any mutation uh, in this extract. Uh, when we have a look at the Cytiva kit, it detects the mutation uh, that is one of the hotspot mutation in, in well-known conserved residue. Uh, residue. However, now going uh, to Kyogen kit, uh, we can see that the text mutation, uh, this mutation is not a hotspot mutation, uh, and uh, the uh, mutation allele frequency is 0.35%. Uh, this means that uh, the mutation um, uh, frequency is unfortunately below the level of detection for novel um, single nucleotide variants. And in this circumstance, the clinical scenario, this mutation would be considered uh, inconclusive result and would have to be repeated. But please let me remind that there would be no way of repeating it because the whole extract has been already used for targeted sequencing. And now, if we uh, dive uh, slightly deeper, deeper in, in mutation on the frequency, and we uh, we uh, we will have a look uh, at this uh, frequency, uh, considering the self DNA yield and genomic DNA contamination in the sample, uh, let's concentrate on sample uh, three, uh, where we don't see any con concordance between three kids. And as you can see, um, uh, chitin appears to be the best here in terms of the recovery of self DNA. Uh, while Cytiva is quite comparable to MacMax. Uh, the major difference that we see is in genomic DNA contamination. Again, you can 
see that uh, minimal contamination with CIT bucket, uh, however, quite high with MapMax. And let me remind you that this is actually the MapMax uh, kit in which extract no mutation is being detected. So from those results, we can uh, draw one uh, important conclusion that size selection based uh, extraction allows to detect uh, mutation uh, associated with cancer in circumstances uh, where um, uh, where those mutations uh, can be uh, can be missed uh, when other uh, non site selection types uh, of extraction uh, uh, are implemented. Okay. So just to summarize the whole presentation, uh, we know that targeted analysis of cell-free DNA is already in clinical practice, is widely uh, used for non-invasive prenatal screening. Um, we also know that it's uh, currently recommended to use uh, cell-free DNA for genetic profiling in advanced cancer in circumstances where tissue biopsy is not available. Uh, very important aspect of liquid biopsies and the one that holds uh, the highest amount of promise is the fact that it has the potential uh, to uncover a full uh, genetic landscape of the evolving tumor. So it can uh, it can allow for comprehensive uh, decision regarding therapy at the beginning of the treatment, but also uh, allows to quickly change the, the therapeutic approach once the resistance mutation uh, appear. Uh, the biggest challenge in the analysis of cell-free DNA is the fact that uh, it constitutes a minor fraction of the circulation and uh, the fact that uh, cancer-associated mutations are found at an extremely low level. Um, from those experiments that I share with you, uh, it is obvious that size selection assisted uh, extraction of cell-free DNA allows to enrich for tumor uh, derived uh, fraction. Uh, and this enrichment and tumor derived fraction allows to detect mutations in circumstances uh, when uh, other kits fail to detect it. Okay, uh, I think this is it for me and now it's time for uh, questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, for that wonderful presentation. We will now move to the Q&A portion of this presentation. And as a reminder to our audience members, please submit your questions via the Q&A box. Now, Monica, we already have some great questions coming in from our audience members. All right. Our question is, is Sarah Extract a cell-free DNA kit compatible with serum samples? Uh, yes, it is compatible. Uh, in fact, it's it's highly recommended for those type of samples. And uh, the reason behind it is that serum samples are notorious for genomic DNA contamination. And as I presented, uh, our kit is, uh, is able to remove to some extent this genomic DNA contamination. Thank you so much. Now, in clinical applications, what is a preferable sample type? Is it serum or is it plasma? Um, I believe that there's a general consensus in the field that plasma is preferred sample in clinical applications, and this is uh, based on a number of reports showing that uh, mutation alert frequency and the detection rate of cancer-associated biomarkers is much higher in plasma samples compared to matched uh, serum samples. Uh, what is probably important that we shouldn't dismiss serum samples completely. They are very important in retrospective studies for biomarker uh, discovery in large cohorts of, of patients on bio, bio bank samples. Thank you so much. And again, thank I want to thank our audience for these great questions. Now, Monica, is blood always the best type of input sample for cancer detection? Well, I, as I said, the, the amount of on the cancer type, uh, the stage of cancer, the location of the tumor. Uh, so there are particular type of cancers that probably are not very well suited uh, to be detected in blood, and this will be bladder and prostate cancer. It appears that urine is more suitable sample. Uh, for example, for brain cancers, it seems that cerebrospinal fluid uh, might be more suitable. Thank you so much. Will liquid biopsy fully replace the tissue biopsy in the near future? Interesting question. Uh, 
Uh, yes, it, it's quite controversial, interesting. Um, I don't think this is the case. Uh, I would, I perceive myself um, liquid biopsy as complementary approach to tissue biopsy. Uh, the problem lies in the fact that liquid biopsy is not universally uh, applied to all cancer. It's not, uh, it will be difficult to replace tissue biopsy, for example, because Tumor biopsy provides you the material to perform histological assessment of the tumor. And this is the main approach for uh, subtyping of the cancer. And again, in early cancer, the sensitivity of the detection using uh, liquid biopsy is quite variable and low. Uh, so for those reasons, I think this should be treated as a complementary approach. Thank you so much. We have time for a couple more questions. Our next audience member wants to know, what is the plasma input volume for Sera Extracta cell-free DNA kit, and how does it correspond to the volume of blood needed? Uh, okay, so, so you can get around four mils of plasma from 10 mils of blood, and the kit has been validated for a 0.5 mil input up to four mils. Thank you so much. We have time for one more question. What is the average amount of CFDNA per one milliliter of plasma? Oh, this, this varies uh, greatly. And, and obviously it depends on the particular condition that a donor is in, uh, but also it depends on the pre-analytical and analytical approaches. But if we concentrate on the condition of the, of the donor, uh, this would be in high picograms to maybe 15, 20 nanograms per mil of plasma in uh, healthy donors. Uh, while in advanced cancer, this would probably go for over 100 nanograms per mil of plasma. Uh, however, I think there should be a bit of caution applies because applied because, for example, after strenuous exercise, the amount of um, self DNA in plasma can go also above 100 nanograms per mil of plasma. Monica Sato, thank you so much for your time today and for your outstanding presentation once again. Would you like to provide our audience with any closing remarks before we go? Um, I, I think I said everything uh, that I want. I just want uh, everyone, um, thank everyone for listening. And if you have any particular questions that I haven't answered or they were not, something was not clear during the presentation, uh, please feel free to contact me and write an email to my email address that I believe was displayed at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much, and I will ditto that statement. Thank you to our audience, and please know that any questions that weren't addressed at this Q&A will be addressed via email by the presenter. And this presentation will be available for on-demand viewing for 12 months, so please remember to share it with your colleagues who may be interested in today's topic. And don't miss out on other presentations on the agenda. Visit the Agenda tab in the auditorium for a full listing. Thank you again for your participation. Until next time, Stay safe and stay healthy. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.